You know it's basketball season, and we've changed the set around. Here in our WIPB studios from Cardinal End Zone, we go to the James Whitford Show. Welcome in to our first edition this year. The Cardinals midway through the season at this point. Non-conference schedule is behind them, and on to Mid-American Conference play. Joel Gaudette and the head coach, James Whitford. I'd say your first time, but it's, I guess, technically your, your second time through second. here. We did that, that special introduction when you got hired last year, but mm. uh, welcome back, I guess. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Good, good uh, be back. Let's talk about uh, how we got here to this point. Non-conference, it's hard to lump it all in together, but if mm. you can take a look back uh, on it as a whole for me at this point, uh, did you get accomplished what you wanted to get accomplished heading into conference play? Well, you know, we, we, um, we challenged ourselves very aggressively with the non-conference schedule. I believe at one point we, we had uh, what was considered a top 20 non-conference schedule, and we didn't win as many as we'd like. I do feel like we got better, and we, we uh, played a lot of young guys early on, and, and uh, and through those challenges, I think, have, have put ourselves in position to, to play good basketball here in the conference. 16th ranked non-conference schedule uh, by some rankings at, at one point or another during that stretch. Did you know when you scheduled it, it was going to be that rigorous? Well, no, no, not necessarily. No, we didn't know that. And, uh, you know, a lot of it was already set up before we got here. And then the ones we chose to add, Marquette, um, we chose to add. And then Utah we did because... Utah is eventually going to come back here to Muncie, and that's going to be a great, great home game for us. And that, that was one uh, it's rich in tradition with the Majerus ties. So, uh, but no, we, we knew it was challenging, and, and um, we didn't know it was that challenging. But it'll help us. We just got to stay mentally strong uh, as, we, as we continue to go forward. That was the next thing is how do you feel the guys responded to that adversity, having to go through some difficult games and understanding that, uh, as we've talked about many times, it's the process more so than the results. Yeah, and, and the, um, you said it right. That's the, the challenge for us is when, we, when we, you play a schedule that tough to make sure that you can, you know, when you're playing Utah at Utah and Marquette at Marquette for where we're at right now as a team, those are really hard games for us. And so you can't beat yourself up as much over the wins and losses and just look at yourself subjectively, what you're doing well, what you're not doing well. And, and uh, so far, so good. We've stayed strong throughout. And uh, the game that was the biggest eye opener for us was Valpo at home. That was the one we were really disappointed in, in our effort. But, um, but outside of that, I feel like we've, we've progressed each time and, and hopefully can start putting some of these in the win column. Benefits to a schedule like that as well. It was your counterpart, Brady Sally, over on the women's side who, who said after, I think they're lost to Pittsburgh, hey, listen, we're learning in the classroom of the Big Ten and the ACC and all these major conferences, teams that you don't usually see every day. Mm -hmm. The benefits to playing those teams early uh, are what for a team? What, what they really do is expose your weaknesses, you know, and, and uh, when you're playing teams that are that talented, you, you get a real feel for what you don't do well because they're, they're athletically, there were a couple teams that were just outstanding. And um, so that you, you get a great feel for that and, you, you know, you get challenged. You're trying to run your stuff against teams that are really good and are really making it hard to catch the ball on the perimeter. And, and um, so I think it, it, it challenges you that way and then you really get a great feel for the things that you, you don't do well and get a chance to work on them. Good news is the tide did start to turn toward the end of that. Mm -hmm. I thought James Madison, probably the second half of that game, maybe the best uh, half you had played through the entire non-conference schedule, or at least since those very early games. Mm -hmm. So it's good to see that progress, and, and it's good to see that all those things you're preaching started to take hold. Well, we've had really had four in a row. We've been, we've been right there to win all four. You know, the Southern Illinois game was tied with 3.45 to go. We let it slip at the end. The James Madison game was tied. I don't know the exact minute part, but was tied late into the second half. We had a chance to win. Akron obviously ended up being a four-point game, a game that we had to lead a few times and was real close uh, down the stretch. And the Kent State at one point, we had, I think, an 11 or 12-point lead in the second half. So we've gotten to the point where we're, we're competitive and, and knocking at the door winning. And uh, in each of those games, we have to learn how to win the close games. You know, when we're starting to feel the pressure late and, uh, and it's the belief that we can do it, it's the confidence of maintaining our poise we talked to our players about dancing with the girl that brought you, doing the things that helped us get that lead, staying with them. And uh, I think in those moments when it gets really close, we tend to press and get away from kind of our identity a little bit. And that's, uh, that's kind of the next step for us to, to get over. It's a great segue because Keith Dambrot said after the Akron game, Akron said, Coach, listen, we've been in close games. Our guys just believe we're going to win them. That's mm -hmm. the bottom line. So mm -hmm. there's no panic there. Mm -hmm. How do you get from where you are now to mm -hmm. where there's just an inherent belief that you're going to win a game because there's obviously a process and you have to win a few yes. until you finally start to believe it. It just doesn't happen. You know, you actually said it right because that's where, right, it's where we are as a team and, um, right now. And the, the way we get from where we are to where they are, you know, it didn't happen for them overnight. 
Matter of fact, there was, there was a, a great uh, ESPN Sports Center conversation with the Pacers starting five in, um, in Vogel, and they talked about having that belief in themselves now. Well, the way you get it is, one, we have to identify that's an issue for us, why, why we play differently in the key moments, understanding that you have to have a confidence in what you do well, think the same way you did during the, the, the runs, play good basketball. But you have to fight through some of those and get them in the win column. You know, and it's the, the Pacers a year ago when they played the Heat in that seven, they probably didn't have the same level of belief. And all of a sudden they took LeBron and them to game seven. They had a chance and it's there. You know, we, we have to earn it just like Akron did and earn it just like the Pacers did. Let's talk about the game in and of itself. That game for you guys, Mac favorite right off the bat. That's mm -hmm. a hard way to start things. The guys mm -hmm. really answered the bell, though. They did. We were very competitive. One of the, Akron's a very physical team, and uh, we, we, we wanted to make sure that we handled ourselves on the boards. We ended the game plus 12 on the glass. That's always a key stat for us because it's something we're capable of doing really well. And um, I was pleased with that, and I thought we defended really well. We defended and rebounded well enough. We didn't score enough down the stretch and, uh, to win, but we were obviously we were right there. It would have been a great win for us. Let's take a look at how it happened at Worthen Arena. The Cardinals got out to a slow start in this one. Akron got on the board, got up on you guys early, but Majuk Majuk got going in the early minutes too, and this is working good in transition for you guys. You were able to kind of assert yourselves inside and get him started. It was, and what you're seeing right there is, you know, when, when he's really good is when he's physical. We talk to him quite a bit about, you know, his, his strength is his physical. You know, you see him ducking in really strong, aggressively in the rim, and we want him getting deep paint catches. And, uh, and that's, to me, what really plays to his strength, uses his power, which is where he's at his best. I saw a block in there from him, too. He had three in this game. He's had mm -hmm. ten in his last six, so starting to get more assertive on the defensive side as well. Saw the Xavier Turner jump shot. That cut it to 16-4. Again, we mentioned Akron jumped out big early. Cardinals fought back. We saw Mark Allstork with the layup and then the three. And uh, you, you get open, Majuk will find you, and he's getting better at that. Oh, Majuk, he's very unselfish. He, it's not that he's necessarily a great passer, but his intent is great. And if you double him, he's going to kick it out. He, he's not, he doesn't care about his own numbers. He just wants to win. Jesse Berry with a three-pointer to cut it to within eight at 27-19. And then how about Chris Bond? Just being a garbage guy for you, missed free throw, he cleans it up. That's what, when Chris is at his best, you know, where we talk to Chris about his, his strength is his speed, his length is athleticism, and when he's at his very best is when he's playing up and down, he's crashing the glass. You'll always see the games that he rebounds well are the ones that he plays well. Cut it to six at halftime, saw 34-28. We go to the second half, and it's more Chris Bond, and this is just Akron not getting back on defense. You guys right. take advantage. Once again, playing in transition. That's that when he's at his best is when he has angles to the rim. It's offensive rebounds, it's transition, and that's who Majuk has to be, the most physical player on the court. You mentioned offensive rebounds. Missed three-pointer, he puts it right back. Juk had 16 and 13 in this game. Now, Bo Calhoun is a guy that doesn't get a ton of love. He doesn't play a ton of minutes, but he was really effective in a few. He was, and he, he did the same thing at Kent State. He's really playing well, and we're trying to actually find the time for him to get more, more on the court because he, he's great. He works hard. He's been effective, like you said, in the minutes that he's playing, and to me, he deserves a little bit of a bigger role. That was an and one for Bo that made it a tie game. Xavier Turner with a layup there. Has struggled in the paint recently, but got into the paint there and was able to convert. He actually beat Quincy Diggs to do it. Yeah, and that, that's one of the challenges for him because of his size. And part of the reason he struggled early was because of the schedule we played. And those guys were so big. And uh, as they get smaller, I think it gets easier for him. Chris Bond, a phenomenal give and go for the dunk there. Then Jesse Berry, the three-pointer, makes it a close game late. You guys didn't give up. You kept fighting down to the very end and, uh, and had some opportunities even late. Cut it into uh, what was almost a one-possession game with about four seconds left, and you guys got the ball back. Yeah, no, I, as a matter of fact, when Jesse drove to the rim there, that would have cut it to a two-point game and, uh, with about 50 seconds to go. And so we, I was proud of our guys' effort. You know, obviously, uh, we're never... You know, we're not playing to lose by four, we're playing to win, but what we can control is our effort and how hard we play, and I thought uh, in those areas we were, we were excellent. 72-68, the final on that one. Rebounding, you've talked about wanting to be a realistic goal, wanting to be the best rebounding team in the Mid-American Conference. Mm -hmm. Akron's a pretty big team. You beat them on the glass by seven. That's a big, big number for us because, you know, like you said, that's something that our team does really well. Majuk does it well, Franco House does it well, Chris Bond does it well, Mark Allstork had 10 rebounds at Kent State, and... Uh, and when we rebound to our potential, we can be, you know, a plus 10 in, in, in games in our league. And if you do that, what that does for us, we're a team that turns the ball over too much. The rebounding is a way to really 
even that out. You know, you lose possessions when you turn the ball over too much. You get them back when you get second shots on the glass. And we have to use that to kind of counter our, our turnovers a little bit. Let's take a look at our mutual bank leading scores and our box score for the Akron game. And the Cardinals had a pretty good day out of both Mujuk Mujuk and Chris Bond. 18 points for CB. That's now four times this year he's had at least 16 in a game. He had six of those efforts prior in his career. So scoring-wise, he's broken out a little bit for you. And then we talked about Mujuk needing to be more physical in the post. 16 points, 13 rebounds. He's averaging a double-double, one of just a handful of guys in the country to do that. I think it was 15 after the Akron game. Yeah, both guys are key players for us. You know, we've always said from the beginning we're going to go where the seniors take us, and uh, those are two really key players for us. CB has to um, – he has to play – use his athleticism. You know, he, he, neither of those guys are high skill guys. Both of them have physical talents, physical gifts. So the game has to get up and down. They have to play it in such a way that uses their strengths well. And when they do that, they're good and we're good. Let's talk about Kent State, game that came up as the, uh, the back end of that week. Of course, you play two mm -hmm. MAC games a week. So the turnaround time is very difficult. You had mm -hmm. to turn around and travel to Kent, which is never an easy place to go. Cards haven't won there since 99. Mm -hmm. You got off to a phenomenal start, though. You couldn't ask for a whole lot more than a 13-point lead in the first seven minutes. Yeah, no, we played we played uh, great basketball on offense in that game, and especially in the first half. Uh, I was pleased because it wasn't just a matter of us banking a couple shots in. I mean, we really executed and got good shots. We got them in transition. We um, we got them in the half court. We we executed our uh, what we refer to as our passing game, the best that we've done all year. And, uh, Mizzou caught the ball in and around the rim, and, and uh, we, it was a terrific start for us, really, on both ends. Talked about the, the one downfall. We did this on the radio show earlier in the week. Points per possession. Mm -hmm. You got what you wanted on offense in yeah. that game. You didn't get necessarily what you wanted on defense by about a difference of 14 possessions. Right, we did. In the defensive end, they, they scored what we call uh, our, our numbers are 1.0 eight points per possession. That would mean in 100 possessions, they'd have 108 points. And uh, that's too many. And uh, in particular, in the second half, we had, we had fell apart. And if you look at our team, the greatest difference for us at home and on the road is not our offensive numbers. Our field goal percentage is actually higher on the road than it is at home. The difference for us is our defending on the road. And it often is coming in spurts like it did in that game. They went on a 16-0 run. We got a little bit wore out. And, uh, you know, they pressed us. And I thought fatigue had something to do with it. But... Um, but we have to be able to stay tougher and more together on the road where we can put together 40 minutes of defense. Again, I said 14 possessions, 14 points actually. So when we talk right. about turnovers, that's seven possessions. And mm -hmm. we talked about turnovers and offensive rebounds and how that can balance out. But let's go to the early minutes of this one. And again, Majuk getting going early. And even here on what is something of a broken play, they lose him in the defense and he's open mm -hmm. underneath. Yeah, that, that was because they had doubled Mark Allstork. Mark got out of the double team. and. We caught him in rotation. That's what left him open. Mark was terrific in this game. It was great to see him uh, and play with the energy and poise that he had on the road. He and Juk have the first 10 points for you guys. This one comes uh, off the rebound. You go in transition. Xavier Turner finding the big man. you got to reward him when he runs the floor. Yeah, he does. He had two of those in the first half. He had that one. He got one from Chris Bond. This was great to see uh, Tyler Cook uh, getting a, a shot open off of a ball screen and pop. And, uh, it was great to see him step up and knock it down. Changed his shot a little bit to get him going, too. He did. You know, he's, he's had so many surgeries. He'd been shooting a jump shot over the years, and I think it's been harder and harder for him to shoot that because of uh, because of its strength in his legs. But he's uh, he's shooting more of a set shot now, and I think it's helping him. Crazy layup there for Mark Allstork and the three-pointer in the quarter for Jesse Berry. That forced the second timeout in the first seven and a half minutes right. for Kent State. You guys were up 20-7. to seven. Franco House with the layup, and then Tyler Cook, another three ball. What you're seeing in all of those clips right there, and it's where I was really pleased with our team, is we're getting good shots. I mean, that's the extra pass, one more, to Mark Allstork gets an open three, and we uh, we really executed well together as a team. And the incredible patience for Mark, too. Wait, the, wait for the first guy to fly by, right. and then take the shot and get fouled. And he could not have done that two months ago. He is really really improved and uh, I couldn't be more happy with the way he's playing. At the half 39-32 you guys take the lead into there and actually come out strong to start the second half. Chris Bond another three ball first bucket of the half that's an mm -hmm. added part to his game and then Xavier Turner that's deep. Yeah it is deep it is open you know it's for him it's not easy to get him because of his size but I'm telling you when he's open he makes him. Cardinals still in control about midway through the second half you see Franco House uh, pretty good feat for a big man, a big four for you guys. And then Quentin Payne just kind of flies through the air. At that point, Kent State has the lead, but Q Athletic, and that looked like a set play. 
It was a set play, and it was a great pass by Tyler Cook uh, to identify it. Another good pass by Tyler there, but it was a great pass, and uh, Quentin's a really good athlete. He's actually got the highest vertical leap on our team. Again, we talk about spurts, though, because you're seeing really good passing from your offense right. at times, and uh, you're seeing shots, and this is kind of what you want the offense to look like. Quick, explosive, aggressive, getting good looks. And you, you said it right. You're seeing more plays created off the pass in this game. And we took a step forward in our ability to uh, to score the ball. We scored almost one point per possession for the game, which is more than good enough to win. And um, I was disappointed with our defense in the second half as we wore down. They have some good players. You know, Darren Goodson had really struggled, and I think he took it personal. I know his coach had. Uh, they, they had an emotional loss to OU. Yeah. He came off and. Um, he played best game of his life, and it was credit to him. Played great, and uh, he and Brewer uh, individually were, were very tough for us to stop in the second half. And Darren Goodson was nine of 12, 23 points and seven rebounds in this game. And he said going into it, when Mac play starts, you're going to see a different Darren Goodson. Uh, he didn't let anybody down on that one, unfortunately mm -hmm. for the Cardinals. Let's take a look at our mutual bank leading scorers for Ball State, though. Mark Allstork, we talked about his progression. Majuk Majuk, 14 and seven for Majuk. Allstork, 15. Uh, also a double-double for him, but the three-point shooting that you mentioned about, it, especially the one where he let the, the guy fly by defensively, mm -hmm. I remember, I think about a month and a half ago, you said, by the time Mark Arstork is done here, he's going to be a pretty good three-point shooter. Yeah. He's second in the conference in three-point field goal percentage. Well, he, he's progressed, obviously, a lot faster than I would have expected, and uh, it's a credit to him and how hard he works. He's one of the guys that will stay after practice, come before practice, works on it every day. And uh, But the other thing about Mark that I'll say is, you know, a guy can have a good shooting stretch where they shoot well in a game or two. We chart all their shots in practice as well. And when you really know a guy's turn in the corner as a shooter is when the numbers are consistent on both ends, not just a hot streak. And he's, uh, he's doing it. I mean, he shot, he shot really well in the month of December in practice. He did it both in the unguarded drill shooting plus in practice. He's doing it in games. He's, uh, he's, we're proud of him because he's earned it. Talk about how he got here as well. Uh, the, the journey for Mark, because it was from Drake to a Boston yeah. College commitment, and then when you hired Brett Nelson here, I know they're very close, and that yes. helped lure him. Yeah, he was on his way to Drake. He had signed a um, – actually, he had, I think he had verbally committed, but when, when they changed coaching staffs, they, uh, they decided to open up their recruiting. You know, he was going there because of Coach Nelson and because of Mark Phelps, the, the coach there. And uh, So he opened his recruiting up. There were a number of schools that had interest and had scholarships available. We were certainly one of them, and uh, we had a real in because of uh, – because of Coach Nelson, I think it was my second day on the job or third day on the job, I went down to his school and, and uh, watched him play. His high school coach was a guy by the name of Darnell Hoskins. And uh, Darnell played at Wisconsin when I was a manager at Wisconsin. We go back 20 years, so we had, we had a number of different connections. Darnell and, uh, brought Mark and his mother up here for a visit. They looked around and saw our facility, saw an opportunity to play a big role as a freshman year. And, we were fortunate to get him here. He's improved drastically over the course of the season, too, and you talked about that in practice. But, I mean, statistically in games, his last nine games, 92 points. I love this stat. 92 points on 58 shots. Yeah. It's the model of efficiency. It really is. And, you know, the other thing he's doing is he's getting assists. You know, he's, he's – uh, he's, he's, I believe he had two, uh, four turnovers in the last game. He had more turnovers. 15 assists to eight turnovers in his last yeah. four games. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's a sign of a real maturity. You know, he's – He's, he's, uh, he's driving the pass now. He thinks pass when he's driving. He's taking high percentage shots the game. We use the expression often that the game will slow down for you. The decision making is slowing down for him. He's, he's really playing with great poise and uh, he's, a really, he's also good on the defensive end. I mean, he's a really key player for our team. And you're going to need him going forward. You guys have a brutal start to conference play. You're the mm -hmm. only Mac school, at least on the West, that has to play every single East school right off the top. Your first five conference games are the East. Yeah. Uh, good luck. Yeah, well, thank you. It's, my, it's more of the same for the non-conference, <laughs> but honestly for us, you know, we're, uh, I've said it from the beginning and I really mean it. You know, this isn't a quest about uh, uh, wins and losers. We want to win as absolute many as we can, but it's a quest to get better. And, uh, and if you do that, the winning and losing takes care of itself. So we can get better whether we're playing Akron at Akron or whether we're playing, you know, a team that maybe is not as competitive at home. And, and uh, we have to approach them all the same way, learn our lessons. And we are getting better, and I'm anxious to, to – uh, to, to keep the pedal to the metal and make sure we can keep moving in that direction even more rapidly than we are. Let's talk about the Ohio Bobcats because they come up first for you guys. 11-4, yeah. and four, none of those four losses are to bad teams. They've got mm -hmm. Ohio State on there. They've got the overtime heartbreaker to Akron their last time out. They're led by this guy. His father's kind of famous, Clark Kellogg. You might know yeah. him from television. Uh, his kid's a pretty good player. 
He's a really good player and he's an exceptional shooter. He's that guy that uh, when he gets a shot off, no matter how difficult, you're nervous as the coach. He's just a, he's a great shooter, he's a senior, he's been through a lot of battles. And uh, our job is to make him, uh, to, to really chase him off the three-point line. And not only to not, not try to make him, the mentality we want to have is not let him get him off. What would you call him, dead on catch? Is that dead the... on the catch, we call it DOC. The ball's got to be dead. When he catches it, you have to be there on the catch and not allowing him to get it off. And you've got to make him beat you at the rim. No question. You've got to make him shoot the uh, ball inside the arc because he's, he's just too good. He's too aggressive. He's too high a percentage shooter. He's not doing it just this year. He's done it for four years. Let's flip that around. Here's Maurice Endor. You've got to make him beat you from outside the rim. Yeah, you said it right. He can he can shoot an occasional three, but that's you know where he's at his best is slashing to the rim. He's got great size. He's really talented, and he's one of the most physically gifted players in the conference. He's new too, a junior college transfer, has 20 points five times this year. Ricardo Johnson is another guy who's upped his game, three points per game for his career. He's averaging eight this season. And Stevie Taylor replaces the vaunted DJ Cooper. Not a high scoring point guard, but he does what a point guard does, and that's hand it out and not turn it over. Right, and he's got a two to one assist to turnover ratio. He's a key player for their team. Ricardo Johnson is, is I believe, hurt, and uh, they're, they're going to miss him. But you know, OU is a team that's led by six seniors and three juniors. They got a real veteran team. They draw a great crowd at home, and uh, they're, it's always a challenge when you play them anywhere, but especially when you play them at their place. And, the challenge for us, the, the thing we have to flip on the road is our ability to defend. We have to make sure that we come out of there in, in the defending and rebounding battle. We have to be able to hold our own against them for 40 minutes. The last guy we saw in those highlights was John Smith as well. He's another yep. veteran who's doubled his production from prior in his career. And mm -hmm. It's interesting because you go down that list and there's so many guys that have done that. Yep. Jim Christian's got a really good program. He does. He, he's built it so that he doesn't have to rely on freshmen and sophomores. Yep. He just has a lot of juniors and seniors and they finally get their opportunity. He does and that's that's to me this, the sign of a true program is what you want. You want depth of talent where where uh, when your good players leave you have young guys that are learning while they're there and can take over as older players. That's that's uh, I think that's what Akron has. I look at some of Akron's young players now that aren't playing that much. They're talented and they're learning behind good players. And that's what Ohio U has, and that's what we're on a quest to, to build here. Next up comes Miami for you guys. So that's Ohio on Saturday, My, or uh, Ohio on Wednesday, Miami on Saturday, your week this week. And I got excited for a second because I said, oh, it's going to be the first time he's played Miami since he was a coach there except you played them every year at Xavier. So yeah. I guess the luster is worn off there, but yeah. is it neat? Because that's such a part of who you are with all the time you spent at Miami to play against them. Uh, you know, it, I would, you know it's, it's, it is a little bit, but I, like you said, I've done it a lot of different times and there's so many games that it's, it's, um, it's it'll, but when we go back there a year from now, it'll be fun. I still have a lot of friends there, but uh, at this point, Quite frankly, there's not that big a difference between teams. Let's talk about the Red Hawks and uh, take a look at this particular team. Uh, John Cooper's got an interesting bunch because he's got a lot of transfers mixed in. He's also lost a lot of kids, including two this season. But one guy that's still been around is Will Felder. Pretty darn good on the inside, pretty athletic, pretty emphatic. Yeah, he's a terrific player. He's a, he's a transfer from a four-year school, I think St. Francis. And, uh, but he's, he can really score, he can really rebound, he gives them a physical presence around the rim, and you can just see his explosiveness when he catches the ball around the basket. Tough matchup, 6'7", 210 pounds. He is. He is a tough matchup, he's a great athlete. He's a really key piece for the team because he's the one guy that gives them that physical presence around the rim. This game, by the way, on Saturday will be on the Ball State Sports Network as well, so you can catch it on television right here on WIPB and across the state of Indiana. Here's Giovanni McKnight for them, a guy who averages 12 points, one of their better guards. Uh, and, and can stretch the floor as well, you'll see right here. Mm, yeah, do, he's a real good player for them, a key, key uh, guy. You, what you notice in watching the clips on them is how much they create off of their pressure. And uh, they, they love to press. They're a team that tries to force a lot of turnovers. If you make them play in the half court, they're not as effective. And uh, it's going to be a real challenge for us because our Achilles heel has been turning the ball over. And if we can take care of the ball in that game, we're going to be in great shape. And, got to make sure we do it because it ignites not only does it allow you to take away a chance for you to score but it ignites their offense talked about the transfers here's one of them Willie Moore comes in from Oregon it took a while for him to become eligible because of an NCAA suspension but anytime you add a guy from a BCS conference level and uh, we'll talk about that with Bill Edwards in a second uh, he adds a little bit to their mix he does he's, he's uh, was a very highly recruited player out of high school he's a really good athlete he's got a real knack for uh, for getting steals which uh, suits their style of play well and yeah. He, he got a little bit of an adjustment time for him when he became eligible, but he's, he's really turning on and playing well for them. Quinton Rollins, we saw their point guard, who's a veteran, one of three seniors on the team. Jared Eustace can stretch the floor. And then Bill Edwards, 
He's a transfer, just became eligible because of injury. He was coming back from ACL against Western Michigan, and uh, he drops 20. Yeah. <laughs> You Welcome. Know, he, yeah, he's, he's a fifth-year player. He's he's been around for a long time, and what he has is a great skill set. He can really shoot the ball, and you got to make sure that you can stay out on him. He's he's got great size, so he can play uh, a big spot for them. But he he can pick and pop, and he'll stretch out, and they can put him at the five, and then uh, you force you to guard him with the center, and all of a sudden he's out there shooting three. So he creates a unique challenge. We got about a minute left, so quickly. As much as we talk about all of the opponents, and you mm -hmm. can break down individual players and all that stuff. It always just comes back to you, doesn't it? It always does, and that you know what we've we're trying to challenge our team here going forward. The, the three areas that we have to get better here is our half court man to man defense, particularly on the road, has got to get better. We want to see progress in that. We feel like we can become one of the better man to man defensive teams in the conference. Critical for our success. We want to be one of the best rebounding teams in the conference. Something that we know our talent level is capable of doing. And then the third one is taking care of the ball. It'll be the Cardinals and Ohio on Wednesday, the Cardinals and Miami on Saturday. Coach, looking forward to it. All right, thanks for having me. Again, the Saturday one right here on WIPB. Also, Brady Sally on uh, off the court debuts this week as well, so make sure to catch that. But until next time, for Coach Whitford, I'm Joel Gaudet. So long.